and religious studies at St. Michael's College, affiliated with the University of Toronto. Dr. Baum has beautifully described to us the movement or the development of social justice consciousness in Canada through a brief history of its ecumenical history perspective. Today, this morning, Dr. Baum will develop the emergence of a prophetic Catholicism. I present to you Dr. Gregory Baum. Yesterday, I uh, presented to you um, uh, the, the story of uh, the uh, Canadian churches uh, collaborating uh, in their social justice mission. Uh, I spoke of a new movement in all the Christian churches that links in a very special way faith and justice. Uh, I tried to show that this movement uh, has expressed itself in what in the Roman Catholic Church is called the preferential option for the poor, and I shall come back to this topic. Uh, and secondly, that this movement has generated uh, a criticism, a critique of the present orientation of capitalism. Uh, I uh, mentioned that this movement has reached a high point uh, in the a Canadian bishop's a statement, Ethical Reflections uh, on the Economic Crisis, published in Jan January 1983. Uh, and I also showed that when Pope John Paul II uh, came to Canada, he fully supported uh, both the ecumenical movement, the cooperation of the churches in many areas, including especially the uh, social justice ministry, and he also supported the Canadian bishops uh, in their very strong stand on social justice in Canada, their, their critique of capitalism, and their preferential option for the poor. Now, this uh, morning, I want to continue in this, and I want to, uh, I think, make remarks that clarify, will clarify for us the turning of Roman Catholicism to this preferential option for the poor, the affirmation that uh, has taken place and some of the theological implications. I want to make a few remarks at the beginning of a more sociological nature and talk about the ambiguity of religion. That is, the religion is always a mixed bag. Religion has always many different trends, and therefore sociologists and other social scientists are interested to find tools, concepts, for distinguishing the various effects which religion has on society. And very often social scientists and uh, students of religion distinguish between legitimating religion, that is religion that blesses the existing order, and sometimes this is called priestly religion because please, priests after all bless, and therefore they bless the existing order, and therefore they are legitimating the existing order, and therefore they cement the existing order and are politically a conservative, that is, a legitimating religion is politically conservative. And then over against this, you have the prophetic tradition. You have prophetic religion. And prophetic religion applies the judgment of God to the existing order and therefore critiques the existing order, detects the sin and the infidelity in the existing order, and therefore prophetic religion summons people, summons people to resist the existing order and to transform it. So we have a legitimating religion and prophetic religion, or ideological religion and utopian religion. And it seems to me these are useful categories for uh, looking at liturgical texts, for looking at biblical texts, for looking at spirituality. To what extent is this a spirituality, a biblical text, or a liturgical text that blesses the existing order, and to what extent is this really a prophetic text? And 
very often we remember that our religious tradition in the 19th century on the whole became very legitimating. We protected the existing order. We made uh, uh, Christian people who were uh, really quite uncritical in regard to society, who simply accepted society as a given, who thought it wasn't up to them to be critical. They thought it was up to them to be obedient, up to them to accept the existing authorities. And their whole religious effort was directed towards uh, personal holiness and personal transformation. And so what I would like to do very briefly this morning, introduce to you very useful categories of a sociological kind, more refined than the ones I have just delivered to you, taken from a very famous uh, Protestant uh, theologian and sociologist by the name of Richard Niebuhr, N-I-E-B-U-H-R. There are two of them, and if you take the second generation into account, three of them, but there are two of them very famous. There is Reinhold Niebuhr, a Protestant theologian, who wrote his famous works in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and his brother Richard Niebuhr. Is there something wrong with this? Very good. Okay, okay, I'll speak directly into this. Uh, there is Richard Niebuhr, who is uh, a, a theologian who was also concerned with sociology and who very successfully applied a number of sociological categories uh, to the uh, to, to theology. Uh, and I want to uh, talk very briefly about a categorization that he introduces in his book called Christ and Culture that was published, I think, in 1953. And he says that if we look at Christian history, we find uh, uh, mainly three ways of understanding the relation of religion and society, or Christ and culture, that is his vocabulary. And he introduces three categories which I want to explain to you because they are very useful and instructive. The first one Niebuhr calls Christ above culture. And when I explain what this means, we will recognize in it the uh, Catholic tradition. And the second one he calls a Christ and culture in paradox. And once I explain what this means, we shall recognize it in it the tradition, the Lutheran tradition, the classical Reformation tradition, and we find in it also the turn that Protestantism has taken through neo-orthodoxy, uh, a theological movement that uh, began in Europe and then to, came to the United States and was pro very strong in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, and in some seminaries to this day. Uh, and finally, there is a category which Niebuhr entitles Christ the Transformer of Culture. Uh, and this is, uh, when I explain what this means, we will find that this really indicates the direction which both the Catholic and the Protestant churches have taken over the last 10, 15 years. So what does Christ above culture mean? Uh, this category uh, describes a religion in which we say that we as Christians in the world uh, can do God's will, can be good Christians, can do the right thing, can save our souls. Yes, that's possible. To be in the world, to act in the world, to assume responsibility, to get married, to have children, uh, to participate in the secular life. All this is all right. Uh, we can be Christians that way. But if you take it really seriously, if you really want to follow Jesus seriously, then, of course, you may want to do something quite different. Then you may want to become a religious, you may want to become a sister, you may want to become a brother, you may want to become a priest. In other words, if you really take it seriously, if you really want to follow Jesus Christ, then instead of saying yes to the world and involving yourself in life as it is and following the commandments, yes, yes, and saving your soul, yes, 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 and trusting in Jesus, yes, yes, yes. But if you really want to take it seriously, then you have to say no to the world, and then you have to choose a higher way of sanctity, a second way, the higher way, and then you live more deeply out of the gospel, and then you seek a holiness which is now detached from the world and which is now no longer within the flow of history but in some sense at right angles to it. And you recognize in this Christ above culture uh, 
There is no negation of culture. There is no rejection of society. Uh, we don't say the world is evil. Not at all. No, the world is good. No, no, there's sin in it, yes, but there's good in it. And you can save your life. You can save your soul in it and do the right thing in it. Yes, yes, but if you really. And therefore, we see, therefore, in this Christ above culture, the religious energy that is a religious fervor was always channeled into this higher vocation. And therefore, this meant a particular kind of spiritual holiness and therefore had no impact on society. And therefore, Niebuhr argued that Christ above culture has ultimately conservative political consequences because religious fervor is not channeled in the direction of the transformation of society, but is channeled into a separate kind of holiness. Let me talk about the second category, Christ in paradox with culture. And this is a different spirituality which we find in its purest form uh, in the Lutheran teaching of the two kingdoms. And here the, uh, this, the question says, um, uh, I must involve myself in this world. I must assume responsibility for this world. That's really serious. I'm here. I must do the right thing. I must be just. I must be concerned about doing the right thing where I am. This is my duty. I have to do this. This is what God expects from me. And yet when I come home in the evening, uh, then I say to myself, what a useless servant I have been. Useless servant I have been. Because even though I have been in the world and I have done all the right things, I haven't really encountered God there. I feel really empty now. Because God I can't encounter in the world, even when I do the right thing. God I can only encounter when I turn inward when I turn away from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of the spirit, and there in my interior life, there I really encounter God, the inward kingdom, and there I listen to God, and there I respond to God, and there I uh, hear the call of God to selfless love. When I am in the world and I assume responsibility, yes, yes, I do the right thing and I am just, but... I don't really live the full summons of the gospel to selfless love because I have to be concerned about selfish things. I have to make a living. I have to compete with others. I have to be concerned uh, about very material and things. Yes, yes, it's justice. I suppose I have to do this. But I'm also troubled by this. I am full of anguish about this. I'm torn. Uh, I have anxiety. The Lutherans invented the word, the angst. That is, you, have, uh, you feel very troubled because even though you do the right thing in the world, you know you are nonetheless a sinner. You can't give everything in the world because what you can give, you can only give in your heart to God and possibly uh, meet to your immediate neighbor in total selfless agape, in total selfless charity. And therefore, there exists then in this in this classical Reformation tradition, Christ in paradox with culture, a certain anxiety. We realize the dividedness of the heart. We realize that the heart is wounded, the heart is sinful, the heart is ambiguous, and yet we can't withdraw from the world. We have to be in it. We have to do the right thing. And yet the world is not the place where we find forgiveness. The earth is not the place where we find God. Uh, we are not nourished in the world. We are nourished only in this other world of the spirit, in this other world of interiority, uh, this kind of dividedness. And this is what Niebuhr calls um, a Christ um, and a culture and paradox. And again, he argues that the important religious energies here are not translated into social action, uh, but they lead to inwardness, they lead to spirituality, uh, which is in paradox with uh, the duties that we have to perform in society. And I suppose that Nibu applied this category not only to Lutheran, to the Lutheran tradition, the classic Lutheran tradition, the doctrine of the two kingdoms, but he applied this also to the theology of his own brother, Reinhold Niebuhr, who was one of the major uh, neo-orthodox neo theologians on this continent. And thirdly, Niebuhr described the category Christ transformer of culture. And he argues this was the original inspiration of Calvin, uh, even though it didn't last very long in Calvinism. And what was this inspiration? Here, uh, the encounter with Jesus 
uh, is of a different kind. Here Jesus is the one who transforms us and sends us out to be transformers in the world. That is here there is a direct impact of religious experience on society. The encounter with God, the encounter with Jesus Christ changes us. It leaves us changed. And because we are now changed, we act differently in the world. We assume responsibility in the world. And we try to transform the world in accordance with God's will. And so you remember when Calvin first began, he transformed the city of Geneva. And John Knox tried to transform the city of Edinburgh. And of course, it wasn't really very successful because they used a great deal of rules and laws and legislation. And people really didn't like this. And when they discovered, when the Calvinists discovered in the first generation they couldn't really transform the world so quickly, uh, in many ways they abandoned this hope. And then Calvinism became very much an activist religion, at least to surrender, to give yourself wholly to working in this world. That is, uh, the encounter with Jesus Christ makes us strong and energetic, and we now work in this world to obey the Lord, to glorify God, uh, to be active. Now, much later, uh, in all the churches, we have this Christ, the transformer of culture, becomes a significant category. In Anglicanism, I think the major author would be uh, Frederick Morris, a major Anglican divine, who wrote his important books in the 50s and 60s of the last century, uh, developed a theology very much in this typology of Jesus Christ, the transformer of society. That is the encounter with God, the encounter with Father, Son, and Spirit changes us, and because we are now changed, uh, we will have an impact on society and change it also. And Frederick Morris already expanded the sort of original Calvinistic view, and he argued that God as spirit is operative not only within the Christian church, where God is praised and acknowledged, but God as spirit is operative in the whole of humanity. That is, what is revealed to us in Jesus is that God has involved God's self in history and is transforming history in the direction of greater humanity. And this theology of uh, Frederick Morris was influential in Anglicanism, and uh, I wish to argue here that over the last 20 five years, all the Christian churches, Catholic and Protestant, have moved from Christ above culture to Christ the transformer of culture, and Protestantism from Christ and culture and paradox to Christ the transformer of culture. And I could demonstrate this very easily if I took the time by looking at the documents of the World Council of Churches, and that is very interesting because the World Council of Churches was founded in 1948 very much under the impact of neo-orthodoxy. And therefore, and originally the World Council of Churches still had a kind of Christ and culture in paradox theology. And it was only under the impact of third world churches. There was the famous Geneva Conference of 1966, I think, uh, on church and society in which a new impulse was given to the World Council of Churches from the third world. And it was there that the World Council changed its theology and it clearly entered into the category of Christ, the transformer of culture. And in the Catholic Church, I think this happened at the Second Vatican Council. Uh, some of you have listened to Pope John Paul II, uh, uh, his sermons and speeches during his Canadian visit. And I mean, I listened to these speeches, of course, with very, uh, very critical theological ears. Whenever he spoke of Jesus Christ, and this was from the first moment of his arrival, it was always a transformist Christology. That is, the Pope always proposed a transformist Christology. And what do I mean by a transformist Christology? That Jesus Christ is the one in whom we meet God, yes, but in whom we meet divinity and humanity. That is, in Jesus we discover who we are. In Jesus we discover who we are meant to be. In Jesus we discover who we are as sinners, yes as judgment, but in Jesus we also discovered our own depth, uh, resources from which we have become estranged, 
In Jesus, we discover our true humanity, and therefore, uh, we, any and every encounter with God in Jesus Christ transforms us. And in the preaching of Pope John Paul II, this transformation, which takes place in us, immediately leads to a responsible action in the Christian world. Christ is transformer of culture. Uh, you have, therefore, a theological, uh, a theological shift that has taken place uh, in the Christian churches and lays, if you like, a theological foundation for the remarks uh, for this uh, uh, emergence of a prophetic Catholicism. Now, a transformist approach, and therefore, uh, yes, and therefore, if you have a transformist Christology, that is, if Jesus Christ is regarded as the transformer of culture and society, then religious energies, that is, energies released through religious experience, religious fervor translates itself into social action and has a progressive impact on society. And we move to from a, a kind of ideological or legitimating religion to a prophetic religion. Now, of course, it's possible uh, to interpret Christ as transformer of society in a mildly reformist way. And it's possible to interpret Christ the transformer of culture in a more radical way, in a more critical way, in a more demanding way. And I want to argue that what has taken place in the Catholic Church uh, is really the entry into a more radical interpretation of Jesus Christ as transformer of culture. And the key phrase here is the preferential option for the poor. I mentioned yesterday that this word has emerged, this expression has emerged in the Latin American uh, church. Uh, it was first uh, formulated by struggling groups, by struggling Christians. It was then examined and formulated by theologians of various kinds. And eventually, uh, it entered into the magisterium of the church in Latin America. And the formula is discussed at great length uh, in the Episcopal uh, Latin American Episcopal Conference of Puebla in 1979. And I gave, I tried to give a kind of definition of this option for the poor. Now you could say the option for the poor is something which the church has always had. I mean, in some sense, you can say the church has always, from the New Testament on, had an option for the poor. You could call this the compassionate option for the poor. That is, there was always the emphasis that we are called to be compassionate with the poor, with the weak, with the handicapped, with the people in trouble. And therefore, we are summoned to be generous, uh, to give alms, uh, to pray for people in trouble, and to extend our friendship to them. And therefore, this is as old as Christianity, as old as the scriptures, because already this is found in the Hebrew scriptures from the very beginning. And you can say there is another option for the poor uh, with which we are familiar, and I would call this the ascetical option for the poor. And this also has been very strong in the Catholic tradition. Uh, this is alive very much in religious orders. There was a sense that if we live the simple life, if we make fewer and fewer demands on uh, wealth and on high living, if we live the simple life, if we live the poor life, not the destitute life, not the despised life, but the poor life in a more, in the sense of simplicity, then we are more open to God, and then we will have more profound religious experiences, and then we will be subject, then we will be more open to the action of God into our heart, and therefore there was this ascetical option for poverty which we find in the Christian tradition, a second meaning of the option for the poor. I think you can think of a of a missionary meaning of the option for the poor. And this emerged in the beginning of the century uh, in some countries of Europe. There was a feeling in the Catholic Church in particular that the church had lost the working class. In France in particular, there was sadness that the church had identified itself with the monarchy. When the revolution came, the church rejected modernity. The church was on the side of the conservative and aristocratic sector. Uh, the working class felt itself deserted by the church and left the church, and there was a, an effort on the part of many ardent Catholics, lay people, priests, and bishops to regain access to the working class. Uh, and there was, uh, there was the theory that if we live poorly, 
if we live as workers do, uh, if we manifest our solidarity with workers, then they will, might listen to us again and our Christian witness will become more authentic. And you can call this the missionary uh, option for the poor. And this was discussed, of course, at great length in the Mission de France, which was a movement to regain uh, the working people for the church. Uh, this was, and at the Second Vatican Council there, this was really accepted in a number of documents. And at the Second Vatican Council, many of the bishops exchanged their rings of gold with a brass ring in order to signify uh, that uh, the a simple living and uh, more visible identification with the lives of ordinary people was important from a missionary point of view because it gave greater credibility to the Christian gospel. You have another option for the poor, and I could call this the pastoral option for the poor. And the pastoral option for the poor is found in many religious orders and in many dioceses. Imagine that you have only so much resources, only so many resources, only so many men and women working for you, only so many financial resources, and you have to plan your pastoral program. That is, you have to plan the ministry in your diocese, or you have to plan the program of your religious order. And then you can say, we want to have the option for the poor, meaning we want to give priority to the concerns of the poor people and, and use most of our resources to promote them and to help them, and then only turn to the other needs of the diocese. And here you have a kind of pastoral option for the poor. Now I want to argue that the uh, Puebla document, when it defined the preferential option for the poor, in some sense includes all these previous options for the poor, but adds now a very clearly defined, more political understanding of the option for the poor. And I gave that definition already yesterday. I said the option for the poor means it has a kind of double meaning. The first one is a perspectival. It means the willingness to look at my society from the viewpoint of the people at the bottom and in the margin. Therefore, I reread my society. I reread the text that is before me from this different viewpoint. I betray, I become, if you like, a traitor to my own class. I become a traitor in some sense to the group to which I belong. Uh, through my education and through my status in society and now look at society from the viewpoint of the people at the bottom, the kind of the perspectival dimension. And secondly, uh, I'm willing to give public witness to my solidarity with uh, the people who are struggling for justice. And this the, the Latin American called the option for the poor. And uh, this, I wanted to, uh, this I wanted to explore a little bit further. This gives a kind of prophetic orientation to Catholicism. And I mentioned that the Canadian bishops in their 18, 1983 statement uh, 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 specifically referred to this option for the poor, and they argue that this is exactly how they look upon Canadian society. And therefore they focus on the unemployed, uh, and on the unemployed because uh, they are the people on whom, who suffer most at this particular time, and therefore it is beginning with them that they want to analyze the orientation of Canadian society. So I want to say a few words, theological and sociological words, about this option for the poor that has shifted Roman Catholicism along with the other Christian churches in a prophetic direction. I'm just really writing something much longer on this and that uh, I, um, I mean, how do new movements occur in the church? I mean, how do new movements occur? I've argued yesterday they, they always begin in religious experience. I think uh, a movement that is, does not, is not nourished by religious experience has no future in the church whatsoever. That is, a movement that is purely secular in inspiration may do quite well occasionally in society, but in the church, it seems to me, a, future, a movement only has a future and can only become strong if it is nourished by religious experience. And therefore, yesterday I tried to show that there are new religious experiences in third world Christians and in our own Christian communities uh, that um, uh, where we experience the divine summons uh, to justice. We experience the divine summons to open our heart to the poor, the oppressed, the people in misery in the world.
uh, and we experience the divine summons uh, calling us to reread our times, to reread our texts, to reread our society, and to involve ourselves in some way uh, in solidarity with these. Secondly, after new religious experience, uh, there is, takes place a kind of biblical testing. How does this new religious experience stand up under the scriptures? And of course, this biblical testing is so important, and I won't have the time to go into this in detail. I just want to emphasize it's important, because after all, there can be religious experiences that deceive us. I mean, there are religious experiences that deceive us. And therefore, religious experience, experience uh, is, remains ambiguous. We cannot deliver ourselves purely and simply to our profound experiences because our profound experiences may really be quite misguided. They may be caught in, in interpretations. You see, we, uh, every experience somehow includes a certain interpretation. And therefore, a personal and very ardent religious experience could still be misguided, and therefore we have to submit it to the biblical test. Let me give an example of this. I regard this as important because we do meet sometimes people who talk about personal experience in a kind of over-enthusiastic way, as though experience didn't have to be tested and validated. Let me give you, I mean, there is after all something like fascist experience. I mean, there is in fascism, we do have experience, and even religious experience. Let me, uh, I had a student, a very brilliant student, a Mennonite, uh, at, in Toronto who wrote a doctoral dissertation on a very famous controversy between two German theologians. One has become very well known. His name is Paul Tillich, and those of you who are in theology uh, will know him well. Paul Tillich, he, uh, he came to the United States and became a very influential theologian. And the other is a theologian of the same stature, but he is totally unknown, uh, certainly totally unknown in America. None of his works have been translated into English. Uh, and his name is Hirsch, or Hirsch, I suppose, if you wanted to anglicize the name. Uh, these two men were friends in the 20s. They were close friends. They were both Protestant theologians. They were both theologians who were interested in the action of God in history. And because they were interested in the action of God in history, they believed that religious experience responded to the action of God in history, and therefore religious experience has to be taken very seriously. And how do you detect uh, the action of God in history? And what are the kind of experiences to which you can deliver yourself? And Paul Tillich argued, that God acts in history whenever there is a struggle for justice. That is, he says, the scriptures tell us that God favors justice, that God deported the people of Israel when they were oppressed by the, in Egypt. God supported the prophets when they called the people of Israel to justice. That is, wherever there is a passage from oppression to justice, God is actively engaged. And therefore, I will interpret history uh, Paul Tillich said, uh, God's present history through the justice struggles going on in Germany at the time, and he looked at the struggle of the German working class at that particular time, and Tillich became a religious socialist in those days, and he organized a, a religious socialist, and he published in this area, and he uh, founded a, a publication in Germany. His friend uh, Hirsch followed a very similar theology, but he came to totally different conclusions, and he argued that God is operative in history. Whenever a people tries to define itself, whenever a people tries to define itself and throw off foreign yokes and foreign influences, whenever a people wants to be faithful to its own inspiration and rejects influences that comes to them from other nations, and therefore Hirsch, uh, became uh, a nationalist, and he argued that national self-identity and the struggle for national self-determination and the struggle for national cultural purity, this is the movement in which God is present to the world. And therefore, the ex religious experiences that intensify my national identity and that engage me in the struggle for 
national self-affirmation and elevation, this is the movement in which God is directing us. And uh, Tillich and Hirsch, of course, argued about this. When Hitler came along at the end of the 20s, Hirsch joined the Nazi party, and he became one of the main theologians of Hitlerism, uh, arguing that God is present in a people's self-affirmation, throwing off foreign influence, and by this he meant the influence of British democratic thinking and of French rationalism and of Eastern European socialism, and there was a kind of nationalist movement uh, that nourished uh, the uh, national, uh, the Nazi movement. And there was religious experience, uh, but of course it did not really stand up under the scripture. Why not? Because it did not have the promise of universality. It was only for the Germans and not for, and not for the world and not for all peoples. It didn't have the promise of universality. And from the scriptures we know, one thing we know is that ultimately God is gracious to the whole of humanity. Ultimately God wants to redeem the whole of history. Uh, and therefore this is a kind of a striking example to show the need for testing religious experiences in the scriptures. And though it would be possible for me to turn to the recent biblical studies uh, that have examined very carefully the option for the poor and have said, does this really stand up under the scriptures? And a whole literature has developed about this. And some of, as you know, some scripture scholars use very highly critical method in the study of the scriptures, and we need these biblical scholars, the historical critical method. And there are other critical methods that are used. Uh, but it seems to me also important to say the Bible is a book that even speaks to us without the use of these critical methods. I mean, even if you use the Bible very carefully and read it very carefully and read it, read it as a text of literature without having studied all the critical methods, but read it carefully, not just the passage here and the passage there, but really try to penetrate, use it as a kind of literary unity, as it were, and try to, uh, try to gather what it teaches, the main themes, uh, and even if you use this sort of more uncritical approach, the scripture still reveals the basic thrust towards justice. And therefore we have today this extraordinary phenomenon that there is then this concern for social justice not only in the major churches uh, that make use of the critical method, but we even have today in, today in some evangelical churches, in some more conservative Protestant churches that reject the higher criticism, uh, a shift to the left that has taken place. I think it's worthwhile saying this because this isn't really known so widely. That you have, for instance, in uh, the United States, you have uh, sort of evangelical Christians with a somewhat fundamentalist reading of the scriptures who have become critics of the government and critics of capitalism because they argue the book, the book really tells us about God and God's bias for the poor and God's concern for the poor, and God's judgment on a wicked society that shrugs its shoulders uh, in regard to the weak and to those who need help. And therefore, it is really the good book that tells us that we are moving in the wrong direction, the wrong direction in the West, that we have to be concerned about the hungry, and we have to listen to the people in the third world, and we have to change our economic policies and our national policies. And if you are interested in evangelicals of this type, you can buy, you can look at the Sojourner, uh, a publication that comes out of Washington, the Sojourner's community. The founder is Jim Wallace, an evangelical Christian who reads the Bible, but who finds in it God summons to social justice. Or we can go to find other examples of this kind. There are conservative evangelical Christians in Latin America who don't use the higher methods of biblical criticism. And yet they find in the scriptures uh, God summons uh, to social justice. Let me give one example. I didn't mean to talk about all these things, but uh, this may be interesting. Uh, this is an example of this. I just re recently read a book called God So Loved the Third World. You know, God to love the world, God to love the third world. And if you read such a title, then you know you can safely read such a book. And uh, we are looking forward to uh, 
uh, to what you're going to learn from it. Uh, this is written by a Protestant uh, Old Testament scholar called Hanks, a man who, a Baptist, who was trained in the United States and he was sent to uh, Central America and he remained for many, many years in Central America and he taught scripture at an evangelical seminary there. And eventually he was enormously touched by the enormous misery in Latin America, the masses and masses of people who are dispossessed and who are marginalized and who are really destitute and in poverty and uh, culture and society that remains rather indifferent to this. And he felt this was really wrong, but he didn't know how to deal with this as the evangelical, as the individualistic evangelical that he was. That is, he only talked about personal conversion and he didn't understand that the gospel also had, was a judgment on a society that permitted people uh, to be so marginalized. And so he was very much impressed by the Latin American Catholic liberation theologians and he liked their conclusions and he liked their action and he felt very much in harmony with them and he wanted to be in solidarity with the poor but he said I am an evangelical Christian therefore I cannot really use the same methods that the Catholic theologians use. That is in Catholic theology we have always been in dialogue with philosophy and we have been in dialogue with the social, more recently with the social sciences. That is all in antiquity uh, in the Catholic tradition has always been in dialogue with philosophy and we have made use of philosophical tools uh, drawn from Plato and drawn from Aristotle and drawn from Neoplatonism and drawn from various secular traditions in order to put into words and to conceptualize the Christian tradition. In the Catholic tradition, therefore, this dialogue is more easy. Uh, while in evangel the evangelicals feel that they want to rely on the scripture alone and therefore Hanks felt, you know, I really have to we read the scripture and find in it what is God's call, what is God's warrant. And he tells us in the introduction to his book that he consulted the major biblical dictionaries and the major biblical studies and he found that under, the, under poverty and under oppression he didn't find very much. And he thought that maybe tenured uh, professors of scriptural studies aren't really that interested, haven't been that interested in questions of poverty and oppression. And therefore, maybe that's why the dictionaries didn't tell him very much about it. And so he said he said, uh, had to sit down and do his own research. And he did his own research, and he, and he underlined in the Bible all the references to poverty and oppression and the misery of living. And when he underlined this with a red pencil, to his amazement, after he was finished, the whole damn Bible was full of red lines because the Bible really talks almost about nothing else uh, but the people who suffer and that God has mercy on them and that there are divine promises operative uh, for their deliverance. And then he made a very careful analysis, a technical careful analysis of poverty and misery in the scriptures. And he argued that if we read the scriptures carefully, even without any particular critical tools of form criticism and uh, uh, other forms of higher criticism, we discover that in the scripture uh, that one cause of poverty is oppression. And therefore, says, I don't need the social scientists. I don't need secular scholars who tell me uh, that the origin of poverty is oppression. The Bible itself, especially in the Old Testament, has analyzed this for me. And therefore, there is a whole group then of evangelicals who simply follow the scriptures uh, who have uh, listened to God's voice and who have also opted, have entered into this prophetic option, the preferential option for the poor. Uh, religious experience is in need of biblical testing. Thirdly, uh, after we have religious experience, we have biblical testing, and then of course there are all kind of difficult theological questions that emerge. After all, we have to relate the new to the great tradition. How does this tie into the great tradition? I mean, there are all kinds of difficult questions that emerge. And therefore, we need eggheads, we need theologians, I suppose, who sit down and who really deal with these very difficult questions uh, that, uh, that emerge. And can we deal with them? Is it possible to, yes, to move into the option for the poor without really going against more traditional Christian and Catholic teaching? And so just to show you, uh, to raise one of these difficulties. Uh, the preferential option for the poor uh, 
can we really reconcile this with the commandment that we are to love our enemy and with the call of Christians to love all their neighbors and with the call addressed to Christians for universal solidarity? I mean, could it not be argued? Enemies. And therefore, these are, of course, topics that have to be dealt with. And of course, theologians have dealt with this at great length and so have a number of ecclesiastical documents. And so let me talk for a moment about some of these difficult questions. I suppose theologians argue that the partial solidarity with the poor, with workers, with the exploited, with the native peoples uh, is a means to an end. It's a means to transforming society so that then our solidarity can become universal. In other words, these theologians would argue that love, Christian love, universal Christian love, in a society in which injustices are structurally protected, transforms itself into the yearning for justice. That is, love in an unjust society transforms itself into a yearning for justice. Why? Because if I love my neighbor and my neighbor is suffering under unjust structures, my neighbor is oppressed, then my love for the neighbor transforms itself into a yearning that these burdens will be lifted from my brother and sister. And therefore the yearning for justice and therefore love transforms itself into yearning for justice and to create a just society is possible only through some sort of struggle, to some wrestling, to some wrestling is necessary. And therefore solidarity with the brothers and sisters who suffer is required in order to transform society so that my solidarity may become universal. And therefore, partial solidarity with the poor, partial solidarity with workers, partial solidarity with native peoples uh, is possible and recommended to Christians, not because they shrug their shoulders in regard to the sector of society that belongs to the strong and the wealthy and the powerful, uh, but because they want to transform society in such a way that we shall then be able to embrace in the same act of solidarity all our citizens. This is the first kind of consideration. A second theological consideration which comes to us ultimately, yes, for the first time, uh, this was really goes back to the, uh, to, yes, to a very, very difficult but important book by Hegel written at the end of the 18th century uh, in which uh, the phenomenology of the spirit in which he analyzes in a uh, magnificently the master-slave relationship a famous analysis of the master-slave relationship. And in this analysis, Hegel shows that the master-servant relationship not only damages the humanity of the servant, that is the servant by being, uh, by being unable to participate in decisions that affect his or her life, uh, is alienated, becomes estranged from his or her humanity, and therefore the humanity of the servant is damaged uh, through slavery, through servanthood. And Hegel argued not only is the humanity of the servant damaged uh, through uh, this form of domination, uh, but the humanity of the master is also damaged. That the, the rulers, the masters too, suffer in their humanity. That is, they too become impoverished. Their suffering is different, quite obviously, but they too are impoverished. They too distort their humanity because they define themselves, not first of all, as persons, as brothers and sisters, uh, as people who share, but they define themselves, first of all, as masters, as dominators, and therefore they destroy in themselves all kinds of qualities that God has put into them and therefore they narrow themselves, they make caricatures of themselves, uh, they too damage their humanity. And therefore, if that is true, therefore any movement that tries to liberate 
oppressed people from the yoke under which they suffer aims, therefore, not only at restoring the humanity of the oppressed, but also aims at restoring the humanity of the oppressor. And therefore, again, uh, this is then an action inspired by love, which reaches not only the people who are oppressed, but ultimately also the whole of humanity. And it seems to me that the woman's movement, uh, this sort of important sort of uh, this the woman's movement, it seems to me, has really brought out this so very well that the subjugation of women uh, is not only something which is a burden to women and distorts their psychology and distorts their humanity, but males too, by defining themselves as males over against women, uh, emphasize in themselves certain characteristic and allow uh, other characteristic to become atrophied that men too uh, become caricatures and lose of their humanity and therefore the woman's movement uh, at least in many of their representatives therefore want to deliver want to transform society so that we truly become uh, participants and sharers uh, and this is not only a promise for women for greater freedom and greater humanity but it's also a promise for men uh, to enter more deeply into their humanity and therefore again the option for the poor the option for the people in the margin at the bottom uh, therefore is not simply abandoning universal charity is not simply forgetting about the love of enemy is not simply forgetting about the great Christian tradition that ultimately embraces the whole of the human family in love uh, but it relates responsibly to this great tradition so here I give one I read one difficulty in regard to the preference of the poor, and theologians really deal with this at some length. Uh, there is perhaps one other difficulty I want to raise, which is even more, diff more even graver. Implicit in the preferential option for the poor is not only the biblical call to justice. That's there too. I would argue implicit in it is also a particular kind of anthropology, that's a big word, a particular kind of understanding the human being. And that is not directly derived from the scriptures, that I think is derived from modernity, from the enlightenment. And what word shall I use for this? I will say that uh, that implicit in this option for the poor and the struggle for justice um, is the concept of the human being as subject. Now what does it mean, man as subject, the human being as subject? It means that human beings are meant to be responsible for themselves, for their society, for their world, for their history that we are meant to assume responsibility for our world and for our future. That is, we are subjects to the extent that we assume this responsibility. And it's quite obviously that this is a concept that the ancients could not know. Because after all, in, it was only really since the 17th century that we had the emergence of an imagination, of a political imagination, that began to think of society basically as humanly made. We make society and because we make society we can also dismantle it and change it. We are really directly responsible for society. This, this is the kind of democratic imagination uh, which uh, began possibly in the 17th century, became stronger and stronger. We don't find this in the ancients in the same way. There were certain moments in biblical history perhaps when people felt that they are responsible for their people. I mean, when the Hebrew prophets be wrote, there were the sense, there were the moment in the history of Israel where uh, it was possible for kings and to do something good and to be concerned about justice. And therefore it was possible if there was public opinion to, pre to pressure these kings uh, to, uh, to transform society significantly. And why was this possible in Israel? And this wasn't possible in other, in other kingdoms in the, in, the, in the Near East because after all the kingship in Israel was not the original form of government. The original form of government in Israel was after all a federation of tribes.
Uh, you remember the book of the judges when there were the federation of tribes. Kingship came in Israel really at a later moment. And when kingship came at a moment when Israel was greatly under pressure from the Phoenicians and from outside pressures, and you needed a more centralized authority, and kingship came, and God, in fact, called a king, God also sent prophets to Israel to, that reminded the Israelites of the previous state of affairs, when there was more democracy and more participation and greater freedom, greater personal freedom. And therefore, kingship in Israel was always accompanied by a critique of kingship. And we found it at the very beginning when David was unfaithful and sinner, sinful, a prophet was called and he uh, reprimanded David. And the story of Nathan reprimanding David was repeated over again, over and over again in the scriptures. Uh, let's not forget the king of the sinner, 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 we don't forget it, because they were terribly afraid that if we don't realize the people who are above us are sinners, then we might make idols of them and then we might lose the will and the power to assume responsibility for our community and this after all was the inheritance of Israel. And therefore we find then in this early period of Israel's history that the prophets were recognized, they were institutionalized in some sense, they had a social place, they were recognized as voices because they were based on a previous experience that the Israelites had. But of course, after the, when Israel eventually was destroyed and after the exile and Israel became simply a tiny province in huge empires, uh, then of course uh, there was no possibility of pe people having any responsibility for their society. And then we read Ecclesiastes and then we read uh, the Book of Wisdom and then we find a very different kind of spirituality because here it was quite impossible for people to exert influence on the way society was. And therefore in most situations in society it became simply impossible to change. And we were only in modern times when we developed science and technology, when we developed means of communication, when we developed uh, some democratic tools and had some democratic experiences that people could really significantly modify culture and society, that there grew very slowly a kind of new consciousness that we as people are really collectively responsible for who we are and for who we will be. A man as subject, that is a human being as subject of his or her history uh, surely this is something that has emerged in modernity and therefore our ancient Christian theology did not have it, our medieval Christian theology did not have this and when modernity came Roman Catholicism even rejected this. Some of you from your school days might remember studying the Syllabus of Errors of 1864. It remains one of my favorite documents still. Uh, uh, I suppose to, uh, to, uh, to, to illustrate the kind of fallibility aspect of Catholic teaching. Uh, uh, this was uh, a document in which the Catholic Church simply repudiated modern society, uh, repudiated democracy, repudiated capitalism, I'm not, I'm not so sorry about that, uh, repudiated uh, uh, the modern industrial and technological developments repudiated liberalism, repudiated religious liberty and all the human rights. This was the modern world that was based from a Catholic point of view on a false view of the human being, a human being who was wanted to assume rational responsibility for his or her social reality. And of course the encounter of religion with modernity is always very problematic and difficult. We see this in Christianity, we saw this in Judaism, and we, we see this today in all the other major religions. That is, the encounter of religion and modernity is very, very difficult. Uh, the first reaction of religion is usually a rejection of modernity, and then religion return, turns to a kind of artificial orthodoxy. You cling to cling to what you heard of, because you are kind of threatened by the culture, and you have a kind of orthodoxy is really something that is a reaction to modernity, I mean orthodoxy in a kind of vigorous sense of here we stand and we defend this is really a reaction to modernity. That is not really the great tradition. The great tradition was really flexible and open and willing to integrate and when the church moved into new culture, new countries, it was willing to integrate these customs and culture, cultural symbols. But 
orthodoxy as we have experienced it is really a reaction against modernity. And we find this, of course, in Judaism. We've, uh, we found this in Judaism at one time, and we find this today in, in Islam, and we find this in some parts of Hinduism and so on, the first reaction. Then there is a second reaction sometimes, uh, and then religions become over-enthusiastic about modernity. And they deliver themselves over to modernity without really protecting their own inspiration. And then we have a kind of modernism that could occur, that is a certain kind of surrender of confidence in one's own resources, and religions try to simply imitate modernity. And if they do this for a while, they discover very quickly all the contradictions built into modernity, and they discover very quickly that they undermine their own resources, and therefore they begin to disappear. The first reaction usually is a no. The second reaction then is an uncritical yes, and only after a struggle of some maturity uh, do religions then come to a critical yes to modernity, a critical yes to modernity, that is a yes that really retrieves their own resources and retrieves their own scriptures and retrieves their own inspiration, and they come to a more dialectical, a more nuanced approach to modernity that enables them to keep their identity and to keep uh, the uh, values of their great tradition. And so the Catholic Church, first of all, rejected, uh, rejected this modern concept of the human being as subject, and only very recently do we find the notion of the human being as subject in Catholic theology, and most recently in the writings of Pope John Paul II. That is, uh, the, uh, uh, this is very central to, uh, to his theology. Man as subject, we are meant to be subject, that is, we are meant uh, to be responsible for our collective existence. And on the basis of this, uh, the Latin American bishops have talked about the raising of consciousness. The Latin American bishops have said part of Christian preaching is consciousness raising. And they define what they mean by this. They say consciousness raising uh, is the initiation of people into a discovery. That is to help people discover all the factors in their social existence that prevent them from participating in decision-making. That is, all the historical factors that prevent them from being subjects, that prevent them from assuming responsibility for their collective being, for who they will be in the future. Consciousness raising as part of Christian preaching in Latin America. Man, the human being, as subject. And of course, theologians have to really ask themselves difficult questions about this. Is this really biblically warranted? Can we really talk about man, the human being, as subject? Isn't this sort of Pelagian? Isn't this Promethean in some sense? You could say, after all, the Bible says that God is the subject of history. It is God who is the great mystery that directs history and that directs us and that delivers us, and that empowers us, and therefore, is it really permissible to talk about man, the human being, as the subject of history, number one? And number two, is not this language about man as subject Pelagian? Now, some of you uh, weren't trained in theology, and therefore you don't know what Pelagianism is. Uh, um, is it, isn't it Promethean? I mean, Prometheus, I mean, is very often taken as a symbol of self-salvation. I mean, isn't if man is subject of his or her history, doesn't this mean that people really are the authors of their own salvation? Doesn't this really mean that people themselves, out of their own energy and own resources, create their future? And isn't this totally against the scriptures? And Pelagian, the Pelagian heresy, the only heresy in the Christian tradition for which I have no sympathy whatsoever, uh, is the Pelagian heresy in the fourth century. I suppose I'm an Augustinian. Uh, and uh, uh, the Pelagians argued that, um, uh, oh yes, we need God's help uh, to be good, yes, but basically it's our own willpower. It's our own determination. That the Pelagians put a lot of emphasis on willpower. We have to do it ourselves. So you chin yourself into, into virtue. <coughs> you chin yourself into virtue. And... I suppose the Augustinians in the Catholic Church always felt that the Jesuits had inherited some of this Pelagian spirit. 
uh, and I, w I don't want to go into Molinism and all these uh, great uh, post-medieval controversies, uh, but Pelagianism was condemned by the Catholic Church in the fourth century, the Council of Orange, the first Council of Orange, the second Council of Orange. Uh, it was condemned, the Council of Trent, uh, that is the teaching, Catholic teaching was, and we were joined later on by Lutherans and by all Protestants in this, that the good news is not that man is good, but that God is good. That is, the good news is that while we make a mess of things, uh, there's something going on in us over which we have no power that's bigger than we are, uh, that is constantly forgiving our stupidity and our malice and is summoning us forth to do good things. That ultimately the mystery of our future is not sort of is not in our own pocket. Uh, we don't have the key to our existence in our own pocket, that we can be proud of it, but the key to our future is in God's pocket and we only have trust is the only way in which we, this key can be available to us. And therefore the good news surely is that uh, that something is going on in us. Uh, uh, we are not the authors of our salvation. We are not the authors of our virtue, of our goodness, uh, but this is divine grace that is operative among us. And this uh, anti -Pelagian, uh, condemnation of Pelagianism, the primacy of grace uh, in the classical uh, Catholic theology, surely uh, uh, is this now questioned uh, through man as human being, as subject of history. And you can imagine that theologians are very worried about this. And how do they deal with this? I mean, there are theologians, Protestant and Catholic theologians, deal with this in different ways, uh, coming from different theological traditions. I teach at, a, uh, at the Toronto School of Theology, which is a union of several colleges, and so I have students who belong to various Christian traditions, and so I'm quite used to different theologians making the same point, but proving it quite differently each one wanting to be faithful to the particular Christian tradition out of which he or she comes. And so in the Catholic tradition, it seems to me, it is after all fairly easy uh, to demonstrate that the claim that human beings are to be the subject of the history is not against uh, uh, the primacy of God, is not against the divine initiative, the uh, kind of first divine initiative, uh, because uh, we speak about the divine mystery as a mystery that empowers. God is a mystery that makes us see, enlightens us. God is a mystery that makes us see and a mystery that empowers us. That God, I mean, all these are traditional concepts in, in Catholic teaching, that God, first of all, enables us to see the world as it is. That is, God, uh, through God's word, enables us to judge the world, to see all the sin in the world, to see the dreadful things in which, we are, in which we are involved, to see the dark side, to discover the sin, to discover the sin already, grace is necessary, more than social science is necessary to discover sin. We all know all kinds of people who have PhDs in sociology and who aren't appalled by the situation of Canada and the world. I mean, a PhD in sociology doesn't do it. Uh, there has to be something else that has to be operative in the heart and in the mind, and we have to have a particular angle at which we, uh, through which we look at society and then apply sociological tools, and therefore it is really a mystery over which we have no power that is operative in us as we look at society and discover its sin. God makes us see reality. Make God makes us discover our own powers and potentiality. Uh, and secondly, and within the Catholic and the Christian tradition, we would argue that God also is a mystery of empowerment, and therefore we discover power in the divine mystery. And even though we are broken, uh, we act out of resources which are constant gifts to us. And therefore it is quite possible to say that while we are sinners and we are broken, nonetheless we are summoned by God to become subject of our history. This is not something which we do out of simply our own brokenness of our own resources, but we do this in confidence that God is operative among us. And I suppose this is the way some theologians would argue that to affirm that, that we as human beings are the subject of our history, that we collectively are responsible for who we will be in the future, is not at all a kind of Pelagian interpretation of Christianity, some kind of self-salvation, but this is very much a believing kind of humanism, a trust in the uh, presence of God to human existence, uh, personally and collectively, God is operative among us through, his, through God's judgment and through God's uh, empowerment. So these are then some examples that I wanted to give. The shift of Catholicism towards the preferential option of the poor. It begins with religious experience. It's tested by the scriptures. 
then theologians want to examine it, how it is related to uh, the great tradition. How does it tie into the doc doctrinal tradition that we have? Uh, theologians are concerned about all the difficult questions that emerge, and this is an important work that has to be done. And finally, uh, in, in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, once the movement reaches that point, it, it enters into the official teaching of the Church. And uh, to everyone's amazement, uh, this particular movement has entered into the magisterium on all kinds of levels. Oh, good God. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, I will shut up at this point. Uh, I, uh, uh, very briefly, it has entered into very significant documents of the magisterium in Latin America, in Rome, in Synod of Bishops, and the Canadian bishops. I won't have the time to present this. I talked a little bit about this yesterday, but I will now uh, close. Those of you who are tired and have to leave are certainly free to leave. I understand that those of you who want, uh, can, if you want to stay, can stay in this room and uh, uh, address questions to me or raise objections with which I want to deal. how to relate the preferential option for the poor with the commandment of Jesus that we love our enemy. I haven't, I mean this is a difficult question, I have said a few words about it, much more could be said on it. What I've said so far is uh, that in the perspective of this Christian option for the poor, the oppressor is not regarded as enemy uh, but that the liberation struggle really intends to liberate the oppressor also. In other words, I try to show uh, that those who oppress the ruling groups and classes are impoverished in their humanity uh, indifferently from the oppressed, but nonetheless significantly. And therefore, the liberation movement not only seeks to set free uh, the oppressed groups, but also seeks to set free and liberate and allow the people at the top to enter into greater humanity. I mean, this is one point. I want to make a second point I didn't make previously. Uh, I think part of the Christian, I mean, in the Christian literature that deals with the preferential option for the poor, and the preferential option for the poor is always associated with some kind of social analysis, that is, you have to name the plague. If you only say in a parish you are for justice, everybody will smile and say, great. Because you don't name any names, you know? You don't make any enemies. And if you don't make any enemies, you know that you have lied. Because in a wicked world, in a wicked, wicked world, where so many dreadful, dreadful, dreadful things happen, the truth is always dangerous. The truth is always dangerous. I mean, this is quite obviously, if you read the scriptures, Jesus himself has a lot of trouble. Uh, and uh, therefore, the truth is dangerous. Uh, and therefore, to talk about justice in a general way is not sufficient. We have to make some sort of social analysis and then name the plague. The Latin American bishops do this. They name the plague. And they talk about an economic system. They name it. Uh, they talk about the center of power and what the uh, uh, what this system does uh, uh, in very concrete terms to their own continent. The Canadian bishops uh, named the plague. Uh, they wrote a number of documents in which they offer a critique of capitalism. Uh, they, as I mentioned yesterday, uh, they argue that capitalism is moving in a new direction, which is enormously dangerous for society. Uh, the capitalists at this time are really breaking an unwritten contract uh, which they had uh, agreed upon since the sort of New Deal capitalism of the 30s and 40s, an unwritten contract which uh, favored full employment, which respected labor organization, and which favored welfare legislation. And at the moment, we are at a stage where capitalism moves in a new direction and goes back on this contract, and we are being persuaded we have to be satisfied with 
10% and who knows what kind of unemployment, and we find less and less respect for labor organizations, uh, and we also find the dismantling of our welfare legislation, and therefore the Canadian bishops therefore are willing to name the plague, and therefore, of course, they were attacked immediately. So there is a naming of the plague is necessary. We have to talk concretely. We have to use analytical tools in order to understand the various processes of marginalization and oppression. And Christians would add to this, love of neighbor, they would add to this that we must be very careful not to demonize the enemy. In other words, we must be very careful that we don't speak about the people in high positions as though they are evil. And this means two things. Uh, that the people in high position through whose decisions, in fact, awful things happen in this world. I mean, if you study, for instance, decisions made by large corporations regarding the production of food and regarding the production uh, of other necessities, uh, these decisions are simply made according to market principles. That is, they are simply made according to the maximization of profit. And if one of these board members would suddenly say, well, you know, we really can't really do this because we have to consider all the uh, consequences which this has for poor people, uh, then probably such a person would be told, listen, I mean, you, uh, you have this great position here on the board. You get this enormous salary, I don't know how many hundred thousands of dollars a year. Uh, you are really get this salary because you are put here to maximize the profit of the investors, that is the people who buy shares of this company, want to be rewarded and therefore if you have the high ideals, why don't you become a minister of the United Church of Canada uh, and uh, change your job and, uh, uh, and therefore uh, they simply make, uh, uh, decisions are made according to a double rationale, that of uh, technological efficiency and uh, maximization of profit. This is the logic that is employed. And therefore, these people actually make te decisions which result or could result in the suffering of thousands and millions. And yet, it would be quite wrong to demonize these people. Number one, number one, uh, uh, that our consciousness is very largely formed by the culture and the institution in which we live. That is, we don't know what we are doing. Many of, our, many of us men are so conscious of this. I mean, the women's movement has made us aware of uh, the subjugation of women and has made us aware of the subtle, the many ways in which we legitimated the subjugation of women through all kinds of attitude and stances that we took and through all kinds of jokes we told and so on. And now once we see this, we discover the anti-feminism implicit in the jokes that we told and implicit in some of the attitudes which we had and implicit in all kinds of judgment that we made. But at the time when we told these stories, we didn't realize this. I mean, with the best of will, we had no idea what this meant. That is, our mindset really was totally determined by the culture and it would have been quite wrong to accuse us of being filled with ill will. We were not. We just didn't know this was part of the culture. Just the other day, I was <coughs> in, a, in, a, in a group uh, of, of men and women, and two men made jokes, uh, which I found really very impossible, I mean, really insulting, because built into them was just a terrible sort of anti-feminist stance, and people laughed very much, and I suppose there was a time when these jokes would have been quite possible. It seems to me the women's movement has achieved the level in our society that you can't tell such jokes anymore, and therefore I really felt uh, I had this uncomfortable task of saying, well, you know, I, I'm really embarrassed by this because this, re this really comes from an age when we didn't know what we were doing. We didn't know the political meaning of these jokes. We didn't know the political meaning of all this kind of language because we hadn't analyzed it before. Uh, and so uh, we, have, we really understand then that it is possible to belong to various sectors of society uh, and to have our consciousness very much determined by the mainstream culture and by the institution to which we belong. And therefore, we don't really know what we do. And it would be quite wrong to demonize the people at the top and think they are terrible sinners. They could be very nice. And if they invited you out for supper, uh, they would have a wonderful time with them. I mean, they might be very nice people. 
uh, in addition to all of this, except there are levels uh, that really haven't been raised to a great awareness. And therefore, number one, the demonizing of the, uh, of the enemy would really be quite false, sociologically speaking. And secondly, I would argue that if we demonize the enemy, then we are preventing the people in power from changing. Because after all, as Christians, we are always open to the possibility that something will happen to a human being and he or she will change their mind. And therefore, if we demonize the enemy, if we make a certain picture that we put them in, then we prevent them from changing their mind. And when, if there is a chance of arri arriving at some kind of negotiation that for the time being would really be progress, we might miss that chance. And so I would want to argue, therefore, loving of the enemy then prevents us from demonizing them uh, and therefore being open to possible changes on their part and therefore even in practical ways discovering ways of negotiations which without this open attitude uh, we might overlook and ultimately steer society into uh, worse trouble. So a few words about loving the enemy. <coughs> now let's just admit that we haven't been that good at loving the enemy anyway. I mean some people sometimes you find sort of more conservative Catholics who say this option for the poor is really against the love of enemy as though we have been so great in doing this in the past. <coughs> After all, this surely is one of our weakest sides. You know, we have, I mean, Christianity really hasn't contributed much in the past to reconciliation of groups. Christianity has contributed an enormous amount to personal reconciliation and even reconciliation of families and, and even reconciliation of personal enemies. Yes, we have been very good at forgiving in individual cases. But when it comes to ethnic and national conflicts, we haven't really been very good. I mean, some of you, for instance, saw West Side Story in the 60s, this great musical which is occasionally shown on the late show, where you have this conflict between two groups in New York City fighting one another, and all of them wear crosses because both sides were Catholic. On the one hand, you had the Puerto Ricans, on the other hand, you had the Poles and the Italians, and all had their crosses dangling down. They were all Catholics, and yet religion really didn't enable them to get closer. And if we look at Canadian conflicts, <coughs> we can't really say that religious fervor is always a sign of generosity to other groups and of lack of prejudice. And so it seems to me this call to social justice, which we experience in the church, also demands that we examine our collective conscience in this whole area of national and ethnic uh, cooperation and pluralism. <coughs> yes. Is he late? I think we. This question. Did this thing work? Yeah. Uh, okay. This question relates to, to your last answer, really, more than to what you said before. The question about demonizing the enemy. I'm wondering. It, it seems to me there's a lot of things that aren't explained by maximizing profits and so forth. I think specifically right now about what's going on in American foreign policy with relation to Nicaragua. Uh, the, the Costa Rican ambassador was quote, the United States ambassador to Costa Rica was quoted uh, last yesterday in the paper as saying that you have to think of Nicaragua as rotten meat that's being that's infested by maggots and you mustn't think of it in in terms of uh, in, in ordinary kind of terms you have to realize that the, this is a, a problem for exterminators. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure what he was talking about, and he, he may have been a very mi nice man, and I might have enjoyed going to dinner with him, but it seems to me there's something demonic there, and I, I'd like to know yep. something about exorcism yes, then. Yes, yes. Uh, oh, okay. yes, yes, yes. yes. <clears throat> I, mean, I think you are quite right that, um, uh, that the kind of capitalist principle of uh, the maximization of profit does not totally account for foreign policy and for many of the dreadful things which we do and for the Cold War and so on. I think there are other causes. If I may be permitted, you know, people f uh, after the Pope's visit, uh, to turn again to an analysis which I find in, in, in the Pope's speeches and in his writing. I'm not always quite that papal, but I, 
uh, after this visit I, I will be forgiven. The, uh, the Pope argues that there is a terrible danger that social analyses and social theories that are very useful at one particular moment and aptly solve problems at one particular moment in society become fixed ideologies. That is, they worked at one time, they were useful at one time, we cling to them, we universalize them, we regard them as the universal situation, uh, as the universal solution for all problems, and we invest them with universal and absolute power. And they become ideologies, that's the way he uses the word, they become ideologies. And he argues that ideologies ultimately become idols, that is, we invest them with absolute power, with absolute value, and therefore we make decisions no longer in accordance with the requirements of the situation, but we make decisions that are ideological. That is, we invoke this idol, we invoke the idol, without looking at what is there, uh, we uh, make decisions so that this ideology be protected and promoted. And he argues, of course, this is true of both of the superpowers uh, of Russia uh, and of, uh, of the United States. Uh, there is an ideology. Both are bearers of ideologies that lay claim to universality. Both offer themselves as the uh, solution for the world's problems. And therefore, the United States uh, is unable to suffer uh, any kind of contradictions to its ideology, uh, certainly on the, in the Americas, and therefore we must regard an alternative experiment in economic development as an insult to America. And therefore, in order to be faithful to this ideology, we simply have to get rid of it. And this is idolatry, and from, from the Bible we know that idols ultimately always demand human sacrifices. Idols always demand human sacrifices, and idolatry always leads to murder. Uh, and therefore, in Pope John Paul's second writing, when he talks about the major injustices and oppression, for him it is never purely and simply the result of a faulty system. It is never purely and simply the result of the contradictions of society. It is always coupled with an idolatrous trust in these institutions. And therefore, this is really for him uh, where sin, and if you like the demonic, enters into uh, the dreadful oppressions and murders uh, that take place in our society. And how to exercise, yes, exorcism, yes, would be required. How powerless are we? I mean, I think that uh, very often we feel enormously powerless and we have to form groups, uh, prayer groups and worship groups and secular, I mean religious groups and secular groups that at least those people who resist this stand together and support one another and either in religious terms renew their hope and their strength and pray or in secular terms involve themselves in adult education and reaching out uh, in supporting one another uh, that we really stand against these ideologies, these two superpowers that are threatening one another and are really provoking possibly a nuclear outburst that could destroy all of us. Uh, yeah, this is today part of the Christian Church. And when I talk the Roman Catholic Church turning uh, towards prophecy, uh, for me this is really very exciting. Uh, it seems to me the Catholic Church and the other Christian churches too, I talked a bit about this yesterday, have really turned against what I regard as the major threats uh, to our world, and that is the nuclear weapons race, uh, and that is um, ideological empire, economic empire. And the churches are beginning to turn against this, and therefore at the moment I'm thrilled by this, and even in the Catholic Church I'm quite willing to suffer some of the other things in the Catholic Church uh, about which I could write a long list of complaints uh, at some other time. At the moment, I'm quite willing to, to live with them and, and back bishops and popes because at this particular moment, uh, they are moving in this direction.
uh, in the United States, you have a vast organization of wealthy lay people who are be beginning to organize against the bishops. This is organized and sponsored with enormous money. Uh, groups that uh, Michael Novak is uh, operative in this, uh, they produced a counter uh, pastoral letter against the U.S. bishop's letter on nuclear weapons, and they already now are preparing a counter letter 